Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Europe Center. My name is Christophe Lombé and I'm very happy to welcome our speaker for today, our first in-person in speaker since October and he's coming all the way from London. So we are very happy that he uh, decided to do the effort to uh, fly over. Our, our guest is uh, Jonathan Hopkin from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, he works at the uh, European Institute there and in, at the Department of Government. Uh, he is the author of a number of uh, great books, a book on uh, Spain, Party Formation and Democratic uh, Transition in Spain. And then more recently, a book on anti-system politics, the crisis of market liberalism and in rich democracies. A great book that I highly recommend you. Uh, this is the book. Um, Jonathan did not ask me to advertise for it, but I'm doing it anyway. And that is also largely the uh, going to be the topic of uh, Jonathan's uh, talk today. Uh, Jonathan in general is studying party politics and the political economy of Europe. And he's taught at, uh, in addition to the London School of Economics, he's also taught at universities of Bradford, Durham, Durham and Birmingham, and had visiting positions at Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, in Baltimore and at the University of Bologna and the, University, the Autonoma University of uh, Barcelona. Jonathan, we're very happy to have you here and uh, you can go ahead, thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, for that very kind introduction. Thanks to you all for, for being here. Um, it's a great pleasure, obviously, it's my first time at Stanford, so uh, and only my second time in California, so uh, really delighted to be here. Um, okay, yes, as Christoph said, I'm going to talk about my, my book, which came out in 2020. It came out the same month the pandemic started, so uh, not so great for promoting a, a new book to have everybody locked down. Um, but I think uh, what I have to say still is quite relevant to some of the things going on. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through the argument, maybe make a few suggestions also as to, you know, what it tells us about the politics of uh, today and the kind of crisis we're, we're going through in Europe at the moment. So, um, so what the book tries to do is think about, well, this anti-system politics, this kind of anti-establishment, sometimes people call it populist politics, although I don't like the term so much. And I'm trying to connect um, this kind of politics to what I call a crisis of market liberalism, or, or you could also call it neoliberalism. So in other words, a kind of capitalism that involves uh, you know, a kind of rolling back of, of, of government intervention, although very often it creeps back in in, in all, all, all kinds of ways. And this kind of um, increasing exposure of individual citizens in Western countries to market forces. And the economic anxieties that, that this causes, I think are at the heart of a lot of the political, political instability um, where we've been seeing over the last decade or so. Um, and what the book does is try to explain why, why I think this is happening, but also try to talk about some of the differences in the way this anti-system politics plays out in, in different countries. And I will also try and make some a little bit more tentative suggestions as to what, um, what kind of future this, is, this, this anti-system politics is pointing towards. So uh, a kind of neat way of explaining the inspiration of the book is to talk about two, two great scholars, one from a previous era, uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, and Peter Mayer, who sadly also passed away 10 years ago, uh, much too young, as a fantastic political scientist whose work has informed a lot of what I'm, I'm doing. So I'm kind of bringing together Karl Polanyi's kind of economic sociology, historical sociology with Peter Mayer's analysis of party politics to, to uh, come up with an explanation of what I think is, is going on in the rich democracies with, by which I'm really talking about the kind of OECD countries, especially Western Europe and, uh, and North America. So for those of you not familiar with Polanyi's work, um, it, it's all about this kind of uh, dance really between the market on the one hand and the imperatives of society and community on the other. So Polanyi's uh, starting point is that the economy is always embedded in society. But by imposing, and it's a key part of Polanyi's work, I really urge you to read this book, which is, you know, it's called The Great Transformation. It was a very transformative for me to, to read it. And I've actually read it three times, and I still don't think I've got everything out of the book that I could. But it's all about how the market economy is not, as some sort of mainstream economists often imply, a natural phenomenon. It actually has to be imposed on society and can end up disrupting society in all kinds of ways. And, and the relationship between market forces and social forces is described by Polanyi as a double movement. So the more you try and push the market 
and impose the market upon society, the more society uh, tends to react uh, to, to protect things that, uh, that it is felt the markets threaten. And in particular, Polanyi's argument, which talks you through you know, the creation of a market economy in Britain in the 19th century in particular, but ends up uh, um, showing how this double movement and this tense relationship between market and society ends up leading to the breakdown of the international order in the interwar period and, and obviously the devastating conflict of, uh, of, of the middle of the last century. And actually, because this is the inspiration of, of this book, I've, I've you know, very often been thinking about the parallels between our current era and the 1930s. And I very often said, well, you know, not that I think necessarily this is going to lead to the same consequences, but obviously in view of what's going on in Europe at the moment, we can't really be so relaxed about that anymore. Um, so a great quote here that, that summarizes, I think, what Polanyi thinks is that to allow the market mechanism to be the sole director of the fate of human beings and their natural environment would result in the demolition of society. You can see how there's also potentially an env environmentalist kind of argument implied in there. So uh, Polanyi's work was uh, taken up by Sherry Berman in this fantastic book, The Primacy of Politics. What's really interesting about uh, Berman's work is it shows how the kind of Polanyian moment in which society pushes back against the, the, the power of market, the disruptive power of market forces. This, this moment can, can go in different directions. So uh, Sher Sherry wrote this great uh, book comparing the German and Swedish cases and showed how Sweden went towards this kind of liberal kind of social democracy that, that became very famous for establishing a particular kind of um, capitalist system with a very strong welfare state. But of course, in Germany, it led to the tragic consequences we, we know about. But after the Second World War, um, we managed to reconstitute a kind of embedded, once again, embedded market system. So a kind of liberal market economy, but embedded in society and recognizing the, the needs of society largely through you know, the emergence of structures like the welfare state and you know, patterns of corporatism in, in, in the labor market. And political parties are a key part of this story because the instruments for bringing about this, this form of more kind of uh, democratic capitalism, if you like, that we enjoyed in the post-war era, it required strong political actors, political parties, which were themselves embedded in society that represented people that had powerful channels of communication with society and were able to take up the, the needs and the demands of society, interpret them, translate them into policies and implement those policies. So um, Peter Mayer's work really points to, and um, Peter Mayer's posthumously published book, Ruling the Void, is a fantastic uh, a way of getting into his, his scholarship. What Peter Mayer really pointed towards was the way in which the decline of political parties, especially kind of from the 1970s, 80s onwards, meant that they were less and less able to perform this function. Um, so alongside uh, Dick Katz, great uh, colleague at Johns Hopkins University, they, they developed this concept of the cartel party. So that party politics increasingly from the kind of 70s and 80s on uh, was no longer the kind of competitive representative politics that, that we that you know we felt had informed our democratic democratic politics in the post war period. And instead, what you had was that political parties were increasingly kind of colluding amongst themselves to protect their the position of party elites in the political system. The parties were increasingly becoming detached and estranged from society, and instead embedding themselves in 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 the state. And what's more, subsequent work by people like uh, Mark Blythe um, uh, and, and Dick Katz and Peter Mayer's book, Ruling the Void, also talks about this. They, it points towards political parties' increasing inability to perform this representative function it, it had done in the kind of golden age of the post-war period um, is part of the story as to why policy moves in this increasingly neoliberal direction from the 1970s. First of all, in the United States and in Britain and increasingly across the rest of Europe. Uh, afterwards. And so this meant that, that political parties no longer really competed over um, different interpretations of how democracy could relate to capitalism. Instead, there was kind of one true way, which was that democratic politics increasingly had to be distanced from the management of the market economy. 
that a lot of key economic policy decisions would be outsourced, would no longer be the responsibility of democratically elected politicians and would instead uh, be the preserve of independent central bankers or, or other non-majoritarian institutions. Uh, and the kinds of policies that this neoliberal turn implies, amongst other things, were this kind of almost Polanian uh, um, um, marketization of society, which in creates all kinds of social stresses, in particular rising inequality, which you know, the United States is perhaps the best example of, but we see in other democracies too, and increasing economic insecurity. And of course, this all culminates in the massive financial crash of the late 2000s. So uh, here's some data to just illustrate this. Uh, the chart on the left points to what's happened to party membership in uh, Western democracies over the last um, you know, a little bit more than half a century. And as you can see that universally party membership has been going down. And this is a decent proxy for uh, showing why it is that uh, political parties are increasingly uh, unable to perform their classic representative functioning, increasingly distant from the people they're supposed to represent. And the chart on the right points to what, um, I mean, there's no clear direct channel of causality between partisan decline and rising inequality, but the ways in which parties are increasingly unable to perform, uh, to, to, to represent social needs in a way to, which would produce policies which would protect society from market forces um, is borne out in this rising inequality, which you can see in the sort of far end of that chart after the, I don't know if you can see the, the years, it's a bit small there, but from the 70s, 80s onwards, you see inequality in this case, the top 10% share of, of total income rising just about everywhere. Um, and so we have a world in which parties are weaker and market forces are increasingly exposing citizens to risk. So this is the kind of backdrop to the anti-politics, anti-system politics turn that I talk about in the book. Um, now this comes to head after the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, which feels like yesterday, but it's actually 15 years ago. Um, and you can see a couple of charts here. I don't want to bombard you with, with, with data, but you can see uh, the chart on the left, what that points towards is the increasing inability of elected governments to maintain their popularity. So it's increasingly common that an incumbent government will lose votes. The parties that constitute that government will lose vote share um, um, the first time they come up for re-election. And you can see that downward trend line. Very few, uh, each data point is a country election. So you can see that there are fewer and fewer elections where the governing parties actually gain support. So the current pattern now is whoever's in government, you're gonna vote against them because voters are angry. But increasingly, it's not just voting against incumbent governments because the classic way of doing that is to vote for the standard opposition parties. So in Britain, if conservatives are in government, you would vote Labour and so on. In, um, you know, in, 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 in Germany, maybe if the Social Democrats are in office, you vote for the Christian Democrats. But what's increasingly been happening in Europe uh, is that um, people, instead of going for the traditional conventional political party options, they've been voting for these outsider anti-system parties. And so the vote share for anti-system parties has been creeping up really ever since the 90s, but you can see it takes a sharp upturn uh, after the global financial crisis to such an extent that we're getting to above a quarter on average of votes in Western democracies uh, going to anti-system parties, going to parties which are not sort of established parts of the party system. So why is this happening and who are these parties? So I, I kind of, one of the first uh, attempts to explain this rise in anti-system politics or populist politics as it's often called is that it's a cultural backlash against globalization and increasingly rising immigration. So immigration and the cultural change it brings with it tends to upset more conservative mind minded voters and they increasingly vote for far right parties like, uh, like Trump's Republicans, like uh, uh, Le Pen, in, in France, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, who's on the cover of this book by Pippin Norris and Ronald Inglehart. And, and certainly there's evidence that the people who are voting for these parties do generally dislike immigrants and have closed mindsets and authoritarian tendencies. And this is the kind of result we see politicians like Trump, Nigel Farage, who spearheaded the Brexit campaign uh, in, in Britain, 
uh, uh, Le Pen in France, Victor Orban also uh, Wilders in, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, Petri in, um, in, um, in, in Germany. These kind of right-wing parties um, represent this kind of anti-immigration uh, attitude. And it seemed like a, a good way of explaining anti-system politics to say, well, yeah, immigration has been going up. Some people don't like it. It's a pretty obvious explanation for why we have this unstable politics. Problem is, though, um, that I think this misses a lot of what's been going on. First of all, yes, uh, there has been rising migration, but there is also a trend, and Norris and Inglehart in, in other work actually uh, do, do show this, that there is a trend towards uh, citizens becoming, in Western democracies, more, more tolerant towards migrants, having less and less of a problem with migration. So it doesn't really make a lot of a sen sense that in a context in which people are becoming more forgiving of, of cultural differences, that they should be turning to the far right to try and close borders. Moreover, in most countries, the kind of people who are voting for anti-migrant parties are the ones living in areas with the lowest levels of migration, which seems a little bit counterintuitive. But in particular, one of the things I think that's wrong with this argument is that in many countries, it's not the far right that's benefited from uh, the sort of anti-system uh, uh, pressure, but it's um, parties of the anti-system left. So we see a bunch of examples of this here. Alexis Tsipras in Greece, uh, Pablo Iglesias in Spain, um, Bernie Sanders obviously didn't make it into office here, but is becoming increasingly influential. Jeremy Corbyn on the left of the British Labour Party actually won a leadership election. Uh, and, and even Beppe Grillo is not really a classic left-wing politician, uh, is, however, a politician that's you know, representing uh, an anti-system politics, which is not obviously of the far right. So what I argue in the book is that uh, this kind of cultural backlash argument can't really explain why, at the same time as you have the rise of the far right, you also have a rise of the far left. Politicians, which almost always are extremely relaxed about immigration and cultural difference, and instead lay the blame for uh, all our problems on a capitalist system which generates inequality. So it's more plausible to argue, I think, that what we really see is backlash against an economic and political system that is increasingly exposing people to a lot of economic insecurity and injustice, whilst at the same time, following on from the kind of arguments Peter Burr was making, at the same time, um, we are seeing channels of political participation increasingly being closed off. So people are having a more difficult life and politics doesn't seem to, or at least mainstream politics doesn't seem to offer any answers. And I think, you know, there's, I mean, there's strong evidence. I have a chart here on the right, which so, shows at least a tentative relationship between the levels of inequality in a country and the levels of support for anti-system parties. Um, so the peak anti-system vote, and this is a, for a bunch of countries uh, in Western Europe and, 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 and elsewhere in the, in, in the high income world, um, where the high, the high point of support for anti-system parties is plotted against a level of inequality before the financial crisis. And you can see that most of the time, high levels of inequality predict high levels of support for anti-system parties. What's more, uh, even though a lot of the debate, a lot of the talking points that anti-system parties uh, uh, come out with are not necessarily directly about economics or about issues of income or wealth inequality, um, there is actually a case of saying that even anti-system parties on the right are generally uh, occupying a political space which is in some ways hostile to neoliberal uh, forms of, um, of, um, of capitalism. So yeah, anti-system parties of the left predictably are anti-capitalist. They're claiming that the system is rigged. We've heard that before here, right? But, but the system is rigged in the favor of the wealthy, that markets are not working for ordinary people. We hear that on the left in, in support of a kind of pro-equality, more socialist kind of uh, political platform. But we also hear this on the right. I mean, Trump, I don't think anyone could really interpret Trumpism as being a left-wing political movement, but it certainly has a kind of anti-elite uh, populism, which in some ways can be uh, geared towards a critique of capitalism and some of the inequalities it generates, albeit in perhaps a pretty inconsistent way. So people on the right, people voting for far right or anti-system right parties um, are not necessarily opposed to capitalism per se, but they're opposed to a particular form of capitalism, this open borders, globalized 
uh, form of capitalism and also this very financialized for, uh, form of capitalism. So you will hear people on the far right in many places, even in the United States now, uh, lambasting Wall Street, okay, which was not the sort of standard idea of right-wing economics that you, that you would expect to see. So the chart on the right shows where anti-system parties are located in this two-dimensional political space in which we plot political parties on two dimensions. One, the kind of standard economic left-right divide, which is on the uh, horizontal axis there, but also vertically, the social cultural divide. So basically, you know, are you for or against more government intervention in the economy? Uh, you, if you're for, and you're probably more on the left and you're against, you should be more on the right. Are you for or against uh, openness to other cultures, uh, progressive values in the whole range of spheres? Well, more means you are more on the social cultural left and left more on the social cultural right. So what you can see is the anti-system parties tend to locate themselves in kind of two areas. One, a kind of left-left space in the bottom left quadrant. And that is a kind of classic anti-system left position, the kind of Bernie Sanders position, the Corbyn position, the Podemos position in Spain. But the anti-system parties on the right are not in a right-wing position on economic policy. They're actually, if anything, a little bit to the left, but obviously very right-wing on social cultural issues. And this slide here just shows how this contrasts with the kind of mainstream political parties that they're pitting themselves against, who are much more clustered around a kind of centrist um, orientation. So, um, so that's what anti-system parties seem to be standing for and the kind of backdrop to how they get to be an influential force. Um, now, I said that it's not really all about cultural backlash, but at the same time, we can't completely exclude this kind of social cultural dimension to the argument um, because anti-system parties are of the left and of the right are appealing to different kinds of voters. So clearly the socially conservative appeal of anti-system right parties tends to appeal to especially older voters who according to Norris and Englehart, you can see the chart on the right, there is a cohort effect when it comes to attitudes towards uh, migration whereby older voters tend to be you know, more uh, inclined to have socially authoritarian anti-migrant attitudes compared to younger voters. Um, and there is also a similar kind of uh, relationship when it comes to levels of, of, of education, which is to some extent a kind of uh, collinearity because older people are less likely to have higher education and people with higher education are more likely to have uh, more left-wing uh, attitudes on social cultural questions. So um, what I try to do in the book is bring together this kind of economic argument about market forces, grading, insecurity, driving people towards anti-system politics, and this argument about cultural politics, which helps us distinguish between the kind of support that anti-system right-wing parties are gonna get and the kind of support anti-system left-wing parties are gonna get. And that's because in different countries, um, the institutions that govern the economy and that govern social policy lead to different groups being exposed to the hard edges of a capitalist system. Um, and according to which kind of uh, economic model the country has, different people are gonna be inclined to vote for anti-system parties, and this should lead to different patterns of anti-system support. So just to kind of um, summarize uh, the differences between you know, economic models or varieties of capitalism, if you like, and the ways in which that feeds into anti-system backlash politics, we can roughly divide our pool of countries into um, you know, using the model, uh, growth models uh, theory that you may be familiar with, which is, comes out of work by Lucha Baccaro and Jonas Pontesen and Mark Blythe and others. Export-led uh, economies tend to run big current account surpluses, so they're lending money to the rest of the world, tend to also have strong welfare states and protective labor market institutions. Uh, and these are the countries that tend to be better able to protect their citizens from economic turbulence um, and tend to have better ways of compensating the, those who lose out in moments of economic crisis. So the kind of places we're talking about here is Germany, Scandinavia, other countries in, in continental and Northern Europe, which tend to have a very sort of manufacturing industry based export led economic model and also have very strong 
welfare institutions. And they, they tend to have generally lower levels of support for anti-system politics because economic shocks have less of an impact on their population. On the other side, we have what I call here debt-led models, which the, the um, growth models theory calls consumption-led models, in which generally um, growth is, is, is um, the result of debt. In other words, either governments or, or private consumers taking on debt to finance consumption. And there are two different types of debt-led models. Both of them lead to the economic shocks of the last few years being much more uh, sharply felt than in the export-led models, because countries running big deficits are going to run into trouble when you have financial shocks and shortages of, of, of credit. But there are two different ways in which you can be in this mess. You can do it the British or American way, which is to have an economy which has a very weak welfare state and which has um, doesn't really protect its citizens terribly well from economic downturns. So, I mean, in my time coming over to the United States, I've noticed over the last 10 years, the increasing number of people who clearly have no home to live in, living in the streets in tents and camper vans. Um, you know, this I mean, is not quite as bad in Britain, uh, but, you know, the global financial crisis and the increasing inequality of the last 30 years more generally has led to a lot of people having really, really tough lives. They have a lot of reasons to be wanting to protest against the system. Um, then you have another debt fueled model, which is a kind of Southern European model, countries like Italy, Spain in particular, in which actually a lot of the time you can have some of this kind of um, consumption, uh, um, private debt fueled consumption as in the Anglo-American model, but also a lot of the time it's governments that are borrowing heavily to finance uh, consumption through public spending. But it's the same kind of problem. You're building up uh, debt, and then when economic shocks happen, you're in a weaker position. Uh, the difference is that in Southern Europe, you have a welfare state which does protect some parts of society very well, um, but not all of society. The people who are well protected are what we call insiders, so people with secure employment or who are well protected by the welfare state, perhaps with a good pension or, or some other uh, form of social rights, and people who are not. Generally, in these countries, younger uh, citizens. So you have this young old divide which uh, dictates which citizens are more likely to want to protest against the system. So the upshot of all of that is that um, you can actually see a pattern whereby if we look at um, Western, Western Europe in particular, but also you can see the same kind of pattern in, in, in the US to some extent, um, that in countries with big, with export-led models and lower inequality, um, you have lower shares of anti-system voting and the anti-system voting you have tends to be more often on the right um, because um, this is a less hostile environment for kind of younger, higher educated voters. Um, and in the debtor countries, you have a higher share of anti-system voting and it is more likely to favor the anti-system left parties because more of the voters that are exposed to economic risks are sort of younger and even um, more educated citizens who are less likely to be, uh, you know, um, less likely to be seduced really by this anti-migrant kind of right-wing authoritarian appeal. Um, and so I call this the crocodile chart. I don't know if you can see the resemblance, um, but you can see that there's a pattern whereby whether you have a you know, if you are a country in credit or a country in debt, it makes a difference to how bad the economic shocks are and which kind of parties voters are going to turn to in protest. So to conclude, um, um, what I'm arguing here, really taking inspiration from Polanyi, is that I'm going to say Polanyi was right. Uh, the more societies are exposed to market forces, the more political instability this is going to cause because it causes a lot of social and economic anxiety. The more market damage to society, the more conflictual type of politics you're going to have. Um, yeah, I think the fact that, you know, I think I'm sure there are all kinds of reasons why America has produced a phenomenon like, like Trumpism, but the fact that America has uh, the highest level of economic insecurity and the highest level of economic inequality of any Western democracy, despite being the richest one, surely must have something to do with this. And I would suggest that my comparative analysis in the book bears this out. It isn't just an ad hoc argument about Americans.
So insecurity and inequality are good predictors of the success of anti-system political parties. But also the kinds of welfare state institutions, the kind of labor market institutions, whether you have strong trade unions, whether you have uh, social policies which protect people from downturns and protect people from risks like unemployment. This makes a big difference to which kinds of voters are gonna come out in protest against the system and therefore which kinds of parties are more likely to be successful. But the, the ultimate, the bottom line, as I put it here, my kind of you know, bite-sized conclusion is we need to go back a bit to some of the good things about the post-war system. We need to revitalize democratic representation so people don't feel the political parties are not representing them, don't feel the need to protest against the system if the system is working for them. But we also need to think about ways in which we can make capitalism great again <laughs> and make capitalism more democratic. So make sure the capitalist system works for society rather than for an elite which is removed from the pressures that face most of the rest of us. Um, if I have one minute, um, I wanted to um, make a few comments. This is my hot take, really. This is not in the book, but given what's going on in Europe, it's hard to kind of ignore it. And this is something I didn't deal with in the book. I should, I should, um, I, it was something I was kind of interested in, what the relationship of these anti-system parties was to international politics, even where some of them get their money from. This is something that we know a little bit about, but not that much. Um, so I did want to think about what the current crisis in, in the Ukraine tells us about anti-system politics. But I also wanted to kind of update really what the last two or three years have told us since I finished writing the book. The first point really is that anti-system politi politics has not taken over. Even though, you know, Trumpism, I think, is here to stay. I don't think we're going to get rid of that kind of right-wing right authoritarian politics in America that easily. But of course, the return of kind of more centrist kind of politics with Biden, the fact that some of the anti-system parties that did well in the mid-2010s in Europe have lost power. So Tsipras lost uh, power in Greece. Um, Podemos hasn't really has been able to get into government, but only with the mainstream Socialist Party. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn has lost control of the Labour Party in Britain. So I think the anti-system politics has not proved durable. They've not been able to cement their grip on power. Um, the far right in Germany seems to be waning too. Mainstream parties seem to be winning back support. At the very least, they're winning back government power. So maybe the system is managing to hold off this threat. And one of the reasons it's holding off this threat is indeed because policy change has resulted from some of these pressures. So quite apart from the sort of halting of, of globalization in a way, um, things like the Trump trade wars, which didn't really undermine globalization that heavily, but was a signal that this age of a kind of free for all in global, global trade was over. And of course, the response to the pandemic, which is, you know, again, unprecedented levels of government help uh, for, for incomes, not only in Europe, but also here in the States and the Biden stimulus, all points towards policy shifting a little bit more in the direction of a more kind of social democratic capitalism. But the other point I wanted to make is that, you know, what seems really extraordinary in literally the last week is seeing the re-emergence of a kind of powerful consensus around the protection of the liberal international order, which had definitely been threatened by the rise of anti-system parties, especially those of the right, some of which have overtly had direct financial and logistic support from Putin's Russia. Marine Le Pen, the leader of the Front National in France, received an 8 million euro loan uh, um, from Russia. Um, you know, Farage, uh, in Britain seem to have strong connections with Russia. And we know that Russian money was put into the Brexit campaign, for example. So there are many examples of this. And I think, and I don't know where this is going to lead us, but there is at least a chance that in some ways the Ukraine crisis may lead to a kind of um, bringing together really of the, of, of, uh, or a re restoration, if you like, of the kind of liberal consensus in our, our political systems around you know, aspects of the liberal international order. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this uh, great presentation. So now we have um, about 25 minutes for a Q&A session. Um, so the members who are following, uh, the members of the audience who are on Zoom, you can ask your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So you can enter your questions there now and then I will go through your questions uh, in a few minutes. 
So before we turn to your questions, then we will have some questions here from the people in the audience. Uh, I myself will um, give myself the privilege of asking the first question, um, sort of related to a topic that I talked to with my students yesterday. Um, so we've seen the rise of uh, populist parties uh, throughout Europe and also here in, in North America and elsewhere in the world. Um, in some countries, it's pretty easy to say, well, um, there was this major financial crisis, there was a huge rise in inequality and so on, so that it's the rise can be, the rise of populist parties can be explained partially by, by those phenomenon. But in some countries, it's more difficult. Like in, when I look as a, uh, a Belgian um, a guy, when I look at the Netherlands, for example, I think of a country where everything seems to be going well and where the inequality is not all that high, um, the economy is doing well. Um, and then I do see that there's quite a number of uh, populist parties there that uh, have uh, basically broken through in the past 20 years or so. The same can be said about some other Scandinavian countries, but also in Eastern Europe. Uh, yesterday we talked with my class about Slovenia, a country that people don't talk too much about. Slovenia, if you look at Eastern European countries, is one of the countries that has done the best uh, joining the EU is economically doing uh, quite well, yet it is led by a populist uh, leader. So how would you explain, given your framework, how um, populist parties end up doing well also sometimes in countries that seemingly do very well? Yeah, that's a great question. I suppose it's the kind of Achilles heel of the my, um, my focus generally on countries that are uh, have high levels of inequality. <laughs> so I'm British, <laughs> I have quite interest in American politics. My other focus in Europe are on Italy and Spain, both countries with very high inequality and economic systems, which in many, way, many ways are dysfunctional. And that probably does uh, um, lead to me over-focusing on some of these, these pathologies uh, and, and not paying enough attention to apparently successful countries in continental and Northern Europe, which indeed, as you say, also have anti-system movements. And, and the timing of those anti-system movements tells a slightly different story too. So, I mean, we, all, we see you know, the emergence of far-right politics in Austria already in the, in the mid-1990s, in France, even in the 80s, actually, and uh, Norway, Denmark as well, really very, very early. Um, so I suppose really my argument would be partly that it's expressing unease about globalization, which does indeed bring some of these pathologies that I'm talking about, albeit, to a much lesser extent than in the most hard hit countries. But also what's going on is, you know, that these are, there are, there are, there are kind of, there are aspects of globalization that do indeed um, target the sort of more social cultural dimension as much as the economic one. And I probably would have to confess in the book, I probably overplay the role of, um, the role of the financial crisis, um, in, in explaining this, this anti-system wave. And I'm focusing a lot on explaining what happened really since the, the financial crisis. And I'm not spending as much time really on trying to show why it is that you have rising levels of anti-system voting um, much, much earlier than that, albeit those, those were the exceptions. So I guess I can probably say that there's still enough kind of economic insecurity in, in these countries, such as the fi heavy financialization of the economy in the Netherlands, in Denmark. Um, these are the countries which actually have the highest levels of personal debt anywhere. They have higher, possibly even higher than the United States because of the leverage in the housing market and in the pension systems, uh, which does indeed create a kind of volatility in the economy, which I think is probably um, you know, not, not widely understood. But on the other hand, you're right that when I go to these places, I think, what are people complaining about? Life looks pretty good <laughs> in the Netherlands. It looks pretty good in Denmark. And, and there's probably, it doesn't seem, um, there are, doesn't seem to be as good reason for, for, for this kind of tetchy politics. Um, in the end, these parties have done quite well, as you say, but they haven't been able to take over. What we've seen in Southern Europe, what we've seen in Britain, what we've seen in America is that these parties actually, you know, launching a serious assault on the political system. <laughs> rather than being on the sidelines saying, hey, we're annoyed about this. Why don't you take it on board? So that's kind of key difference, I think. All right, thank you. Didi. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy. Uh, we have a microphone, oh, microphone for yeah. uh, the questions in the audience here. Okay, no problem. Is this okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you, Jonathan. I love this book. Uh, and I completely agree with you that we need stronger parties and better representation. I'm just wondering what you think about uh, evidence of realignments among the mainstream parties, for example, like a sort of consensus in academia that there's no representation of the working classes, whatever yeah. that means these days, on parties of the left or the right, and Piketty's and also many political scientists' work, like Kitschel's, et cetera, showing that as the uh, as some set of winners from globalization are highly educated and professional, tend to live in urban areas. Um, they can vote for the left for cultural reasons, but will also work to maintain sort of wealth defense and protection by opposing redistribution, that kind of thing. So you end up getting sort of the wealthy voting for the right, um, some sort of new wealthy that vote for the left, and sort of a widespread marginalization of the working classes. Um, so Jan Werner Mueller worries that this could lead to sort of, sort of double secession, whereby the rich only care about democratic institutions for wealth defense and the poor increasingly so, sort of uh, remove themselves from any kind of faith in democracy. Do you think that the mainstream parties are equipped to um, handle that realignment? And if so, how will it sort of settle on the left and the right? And a second question has to do with your work on business firm parties, which I know is not really part of the book, but Trump was a businessman. There yeah. has been a lot more of a role for the private sector, given the sort of neoliberal projects um, yeah. of the 90s. So do you think that without sort of further regulation of the private sector, that we're still likely to get these pathologies whereby people who make an immense amount of money can then make a claim to being yeah. better public servants in some way? Yeah, thank you. Uh, fantastic questions. Um, so I think the realignment argument, this is really interesting stuff. Um, you know, I think the Piketty work um, on the educational divide, which I hinted at here, um, obviously there's a big argument about did he get there first or had Kit yeah. said the same thing 30 years ago, but that's a kind of interdisciplinary dispute. But I think this is quite right. And I think it does point towards maybe a little bit of an answer to Christoph's question as well, which is that even in societies where things may appear to be going well, right, politics has changed because in the, the ways you were describing it may have become more elitist it may be that people in you know outlying areas of the netherlands feel resentful that you know the area around sense of cultural loss, which is not necessarily about, oh, there are too many migrants in there. It's more like, you know, people like me used to matter and now you don't. So what's quite striking in the US with the Tea Party or in Britain, a lot of the Brexit voters were people who lived in relatively prosperous areas. They owned their own homes. They were on paper wealthy, and yet they still feel resentful towards the system. I think that is probably um, an area which, you know, if I were to write the book again, I would look at more carefully because I, I think there is something there and I think there is a more kind of symbolic kind of politics going on where, you know, people like us, we spend our lives in these, you know, very, um, very kind of cosmopolitan settings with a lot of other people who are very highly educated and well-traveled and we feel, you know, like, like our voices matter, even though I think nobody really listens to academics, but <laughs> sometimes. And, and other people who maybe in the past, especially kind of white men who used to have some status with a certain kind of occupational status, their status in the family as uncontested head of the family, now maybe feel resentful that that's taken away from them. And I think that does drive some of this turn towards authoritarianism. As for the business firm argument, that is, that kind of comes back to this question about uh, Russia financing far right parties and, and the rise of kleptocracy, which I think is a really interesting feature of Ukrainian politics, which, uh, you know, I really want to know more about because, you know, you look at Trump, but also Berlusconi already 30 years ago in Italy. This was money coming in and taking it. It's, an, it's a hostile takeover of the political system. It's a political system that's discredited because existing political parties were no longer seen as adequately representing people. And you have somebody coming along with a big pile of money and saying, I'm incorruptible. 
not quite true most of the time, right? But um, I'm not beholden to anyone. I can just defend the interests of the people. That's an extraordinarily powerful appeal. And, you know, seeing how Berlusconi's longevity in Italy tells us that we shouldn't expect Trumpism to go away just because he lost an election, which of course he claims he didn't. Uh, and I think the fact that money is driving key political decisions and the way in which actually the crisis in Ukraine seems to be spurring a very, very hurried revisiting of the relationships of politicians to very wealthy backers, I think it's a pointer that, you know, this is something that's going to be increasingly subject to discussion in, in, in the future. You know, who pays for politics and what do they want to get out of it is the question we should all be asking. All right, Johannes. Are there not, uh, in my view, perhaps uh, some more factors, I think, which are playing really a, a, an important role in my view. I mean, for example, in, 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 in Germany, um, what is perhaps, uh, especially in Germany, first, the electoral system is completely different. We have a proportional system. And the problem in the United States, I think, and, and also in, in, in the United Kingdom, maybe in a different way, that the electoral system, I think, is leading to, is supporting polarization in a certain way. If you see this gerrymandering thing, et cetera, all this is, for example, something which in Germany, uh, just because that is a country I, I, I'm aware of, you know, so sorry, make, take this as a point of comparison. We don't have these, these kind of problems. We have a proportionate system. And that has interesting consequences because the phenomenon you just mentioned, you know, that people, uh, if, if you go into cities like Berlin, you know, there are uh, uh, parts of the cities where people are living with certainly uh, uh, salaries which are higher than the average and, and which are nevertheless not really uh, integrating uh, or identifying themselves with the traditional, um, um, as we say, big parties. So they went to the Greens. So in our political system, the Greens, as a kind of um, uh, established in a way, but also still kind of protest party, had a certain place. And leading now for well, the second time, they are now part of the government. Yeah? So, so this is a, so, so they are in a proportionate system. A proportionate system has other disadvantages. I don't want to glorify that. You know, I remember when I was a student uh, um, studying uh, comparative uh, government systems. You know. We were all very jealous of the of the British system because there were at least clear majorities, you know. And we were always negotiating with these coalitions and very, I think, uh, uh, um, a difficult and sometimes worrying experience, you know. But in, in order to, I think, to absorb these kind of, of of differentiated developments in a society, certainly a proportionate system is is able to give other answers. And so, so uh, channeling, I think, this into the system in, in a certain way. Another factor which I think is important is that, uh, at least in Southern Europe, uh, one reason is they have simply made very bad economic policy. So this is something, if you look uh, after the blowing up of the Christian Democrats in, in Italy, I think these, these polarization also in the, in the party landscape, I think this is, uh, and, and the economic policy in, in Southern Europe in general was, was uh, and we have seen that from Germany with great concern over a long time, you know, these, 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 these idea, we can we can raise debts and uh, debts will solve. Our, they don't have to go into structural, really difficult, uh, uh, I think, decisions. We can avoid that, and and this has, is really um, uh, didn't pay off. I think at the end of the day, because you, as everybody knows, there's an end. I think to to additional debts. It's not going on forever, you know. And that is exactly what the experience the Italians and to a certain extent the Spanish, I think, are are, are going. Not to talk about Greece, which is in every less, you know almost hopeless, you know, but uh, so, yeah, but it's, it's very sad. So, and, and, and my third point I would like to mention is, in Germany, I think the special approach after the war was that, therefore, we never talked about a market economy. We always talked about a social market economy. So the, the lesson, I think, already uh, uh, playing a role in the public discussion immediately after war, you know, was what kind of an economy do we want to have? So, and there was a clear, I think, a vote in favor of market economy, but not, I think, just um, a free market economy. That is what nobody wanted. Uh, so, and, and therefore, I think the, the um, a number of, of, of for example, co-determination for, for big companies, you know. I remember the Anglo-Saxons were always extremely against, they criticized that, you know, and said it's the end of every economy or whatever, you know. And nowadays, I think most people, at least in Germany, are pretty happy that we have that. We have integrated labor force in, I think, to the, to the top management, I think, of, of a company. 
which is, I think, a pretty important, at least in industry. And that leads me to my last point. And that is, I think what makes it much more difficult nowadays is that it can, this, the change of the structure of the economy. In the old days, I think, where industry played the dominant role, it was easier to organize because it was more, what is that, homogeneous, you know, so to speak. So we had the, the, the important labor uh, uh, trade unions, you know, they took care of the social uh, uh, problems, I think, and requests. And now we have the services. Services is a much more differentiated, uh, I think, a part of the economy. Much more difficult, I think, from a, from a, a union point of view, uh, I think, to, to play an effective role because it's much more differentiated. The individual companies are much smaller, et cetera. And this makes it, of course, um, uh, much more difficult, I think, to, to uh, give the, the, the feeling to the people working, the labor force, okay, you are in a more or less secure position. You know? so, and that's, I think, in, in Germany, we have tried to work on that, partially, I think, successful. So on the whole, uh, you can say in, in Germany, the potential is of, of, of right wing is, con France, I would say 25. In Germany, I would say the upper limit is now between 10 and 15. It will not go beyond that. We have seen that in the last elections, it's, it's really the upper limit. So, and that is, uh, I think the, the um, what, is, what it makes so difficult, as I said, the, the, the economy has changed. The structure is not the same as in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. It's really different, much more difficult, I think, to design programs giving, uh, I think, uh, security, I think, to, to people because the situation is too differentiated, too different from one branch to the, to, to, to the next one. And not to forget at the end, the electorate system. The electorate system, I think, as you can see in the United States, I think it really can play, uh, I think, a key role. And uh, in particular, when the politicians are the ones, uh, uh, elected people, I think, who takes the decisions on things like gerrymandering and, and these kinds of things, which for, I don't know reason, I don't know, um, has no tradition in, 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 in Europe, at least not to yeah, this yeah. extent. So these are just a few observations, I think. Uh, yeah. So the picture is, is not so easy, I think, to, 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 what is that, to integrate it into one framework, you know, which, which yeah, explains yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, in a way, what I was trying to do with the book is to, to try and have a big argument, like yeah. about a big question, and obviously in... Yeah, otherwise, we would not have the discussion. You know? Well, <laughs> yeah, and also, and obviously this ends up with the being sort of various things that I probably only end up having ad hoc explanations for. But I think you, I mean, the electoral system, clearly, there is a strong connection between electoral systems and economic models and welfare state types. Yeah. So it then becomes very difficult to, to, to you know, disentangle the, the, the causal effects there. Um, but you're right. I mean, if you have a first past the post electoral system and a two party system like in America, and one of the parties gets taken over by a, an extremist, then you no longer have this Downsian centrist politics that we always thought would prevail, right? And in PR systems, it's a lot easier for anti system parties to get a foot on the ladder in the first place. And so this is probably why in Austria and Denmark and Norway and places like that, you end up with these. But I mean, Le Pen started off in France when Mitterrand had this crazy idea of introducing PR for one election for a completely partisan advantage. That is how the Front National got into the political system in the first place. They probably would never have made that step until much later. So, you know, these things happen. I think broadly in terms of like the change in the economy, I think you've hit on something important. The economy looks different to the way it was in the post-war period when we were building these institutions and then and so you have to think about ways of how you can provide security in in a much more dynamic and fragmented type of economy but the point i would say to that is that first of all there are big varieties of different responses to that there's the american variety you make it or you're living in a camper van there's the swedish version is they still have levels of unionization that are i think above 80 percent of the workforce um, and you, you can have a dynamic services economy, because Sweden is mostly a services economy now, and have an egalitarian welfare state. It's not impossible to do. And the fact, the way in which governments like here or in Britain have thrown, you know, hundreds of billions of pounds, dollars at the economy during the pandemic shows that when there's a will, you can do anything. You can cancel debt, you can print money, you can do so, all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, the reason why we now have inflation for the first time in a generation is precisely because they threw away the rule book they'd been working with for 40 years. Um, so political changes can happen. And I think one of the things I was trying to push back against in the book, and I think is no longer so necessary, is the idea that we could question you know, the shibboleths of neoliberalism. I think now they're actually out of the window. I think Trump contributed to that. 
And I think the rise of the left in, in Europe contributed to that too. But I think we are in a different world now. And I don't think anyone believes anymore uh, some of these stories about, uh, about debt and structural reform, to be honest, either. I mean, even Germany now is accepting you know, this recovery fund, which is again on the you know, orders of magnitude greater to, to what they were prepared to talk about in the early stages of the Euro crisis. Right. Other questions? Yes. Hi there, I'm Felix. Hey. I, I, I have three questions. First is, um, so you mentioned that left-wing populist parties emerged as just as strong, as you said, as the right-wing populist parties, at least in Europe. So I, my first question is like, looking at, at the like populist data from Reduce and Bank Kessel, I had the impression it was that the right-wing populists, they gained more over the past decades than the left-wing populists, but maybe you can briefly clarify. Second point, um, I wondered whether you can give me your feeling of the impact that COVID-19 had on um, especially right-wing populist support. Because there are two, two possibilities. One is the one you mentioned that Donald Trump somehow losing support because uh, COVID was revealed to be actually true uh, and, and harmful, and also Bolsonaro probably um, losing support. But on the other hand, we also saw this decrease in trust in institutions, right? And even sometimes a demand for more technocratic, even authoritarian measures in certain places. So, so it could be that uh, even maybe in the long run, COVID-19 was helping right-wing populists um, to gain more support. Also with increasing social media usage due to um, contact measures and then social media having these opportunity structures that somehow benefit um, right-wing populists to recruit uh, uh, supporters. So, so what is your feeling of the impact COVID-19 had um, both on a, a general level and also on the local level? Like, is this like a hotspot? Um, would, you, would you predict that in the future, these hotspots that were highly affected will also see uh, more support of right populist parties? So that's the second. The third one is, um, what is your answer to this puzzle that sometimes people that are more poor, so would um, somehow benefit from, let's say, left-wing um, policies, they still then vote for the right-wing populist that, economically speaking, leads to um, yeah lower resources being funneled to them. So, so how how do you explain this puzzle of the appeal of right-wing populism to people that economically don't benefit from these policies? Thanks a right. lot for a very interesting talk. Thanks. Yeah. So in, in terms of the different levels of support, um, so I started working on the data before the populist data was released. So <laughs> if, if, uh, if I'd started a bit later, I would have probably just used the data. So in my own classification, I had a chart up, um, I, I can send it to you later, but you know, the, the, um, there's, yeah, they're roughly equally distributed. Um, at, at the last point, which is 2018, of the data I used. But, but yeah, I take your point that, um, you know, certainly if you look at Northern Europe, the right is done much better than the left. Southern Europe, I mean, in, in Italy, actually the biggest anti-system vote in the whole period is 34% for the Five Stars movement, which is not a five right part, far right party. And Cyprus in Greece had more than 30% in 2015. So, but, but yeah, I take your point that, that I might have, yeah, I mean, there are some countries where the anti-system left really didn't make much much progress at all. Um, I mean, in terms of um, the COVID, yeah, COVID started just as the book came out, so I couldn't obviously. I mean, I'm not really sure. I think American politics is really the outlier here. I think in Europe, COVID politics is taking a much different form, um, and I don't think there's been much really use for far right parties in leveraging suspicions about vaccinations and so on. Um, to, to gain support. I don't think they have gained. I think people have been almost amazingly ex uh, accepting of these draconian measures associated with very mainstream political parties. And on the whole, it hasn't provoked the kind of backlash that you might have expected, at least in Europe. Um, but I think, you know, it's really early. I think COVID is going to have all kinds of longer term impacts on our politics. I've at this stage, don't really have a clear story about what I expect to happen, except that I think it has hastened a return to much greater government interventionism, which is what I'm kind of asking for at the end of the book. Um, it hasn't come about by the route I, I would have liked, but, um, but I, I think the upshot of it is precisely that. There's been, you know, for the second time in less than 15 years, we've had to throw the kitchen sink at the economy. And it's kind of ironic that after 40 years of neoliberal 
orthodoxy prevailing that we now have in some ways much greater government interventions that we'd ever had than we'd ever had before precisely because of the you know inherently unstable nature of financialized globalized capitalism it just needs to be held up because every now and again it simply melts down um i mean the last point about sorry I, I'm, I'm not sure if i re recall exactly uh, the point but in terms of you know why um why working class voters are suffering the crisis wouldn't turn to the far left yeah I, I think that is a really important point and um i think part of the reason for that i think is a bit to do with the fact that some of the institutional preconditions for social democracy have, are no longer there so fordism strong trade unions you know if you live in a very precarious economy, sometimes it's very hard to see how voting for a party, which on the face of it says it's going to raise your taxes, is going to make your life better, or is going to in some ways reduce your freedom by, you know, effectively mandating membership of trade unions or mandating you contributing to pension funds or whatever. I mean, the thing about social democracy is it did in some ways restrict people's freedoms. The post-war economic model did restrict your freedoms. It forced you to to a lot of the time join unions, contribute to pension funds, pay higher taxes, um, accept regulations which made it impossible for you to borrow a lot of money to buy a house and so on and so on. So in some ways you can see how um, those kind of policies might not have immediate appeal when somebody else is coming along and saying, all we need to do is you know, uh, kick out the migrants and everything will be better. But, but I think, you know, again, there is a probably a sort of longer term story about the decline of social democracy um, which the Piketty argument about education, I think, has has a lot to say. And Didi's question was was about that too. That you know, I think the cultural status of left politics has changed. It is now seen as being the preserve of of people like us sitting in flush seminar rooms, actually. And I think that is this kind of symbolic projection of the left being, you know, the kind of hipster cyclist in London who, you know, earns a lot of money doing a job that nobody else understands. I think I, rather than being a former miner and trade unionist who very clearly is somebody aligned with the kind of cultural identity of the working class, I think that is an issue. And the fact that Trump was able to leverage that and Clinton wasn't says a lot. And it's probably also Biden was able to do that to some extent, even though he's not a particularly left wing politician. Right. Final questions from Jonas. Thanks. Uh, I have two uh, related questions. Uh, the first one concerns what exactly the micro mechanisms are that you have in mind in your arguments, right? Uh, if it is about the economy, is it then about a loss of income? Is it more about insecurity in employment? Uh, does it have something to do with status uh, or, you know, maybe the poor are more susceptible to, to fake news? Um, so I just wondered, right, what, what are the micro me mechanisms that are going on in your argument? Um, and then a second related question, I feel, Two obvious, very large changes in European societies over the past decades have been the expansion of higher education and also very much generational uh, replacement. And these are both things that we know correlate strongly with uh, voting for these parties, right? The higher educated vote less for uh, anti-system parties uh, and uh, right, older people are more likely to vote for uh, anti-system parties. Um, so. I just wondered how do these developments tie into your argument and what are then the micro mechanisms that are behind the argument that you make? Yeah, uh, great question. In terms of micro mechanisms, it's, it's really very simple. You know, there isn't a, I didn't do it, any individual level, level analysis here. I'm doing some work with a doctoral student on a paper which tries to do a multi-level analysis which would bring in sort of welfare state institutions and, and individual characteristics like age, education, um, you know, occupational status and so on. I mean, the, if, you know, I, I would expect sort of a typical, you know, unemployed uh, young person in a country with a dualistic welfare state to vote for the far left rather than the far, far right. I would expect people with insider jobs uh, and strong social protections in countries with universal welfare states to not vote for anti-system parties. So there are a series of kind of micro level predictions um, that I don't test uh, with any survey data in the book, but I'm doing some stuff on that now. I mean, actually, the one part that most of it corroborates what I'm trying to argue in the book. One part that really doesn't, and that I got wrong in the book, I shouldn't advertise this, is that uh, actually the argument about the far right being having more of an appeal for older um, voters doesn't work for the continental welfare states. Actually, young voters uh, who have low levels of education 
in continental welfare states are actually quite likely to vote for the far right anti-system parties, which kind of surprised me a bit. But the educational variable works in the way we would expect, which so higher educated younger voters in all of these welfare states are very unlikely to vote for far, far right parties. They, they are reasonably likely to vote for anti-system left parties. I mean, in terms of the educational divide, this is something that you know, I think, yeah, you're right, it is going to inform our politics. One, one thing that clearly you can see developing in debate in Britain very, very strongly, and the Conservative Party are trying very, very hard to mobilize people around these lines, is that the, the, young, the people who support the Labour Party are all young, um, idealistic, completely out of touch hipsters who are just obsessed with woke culture. They're really trying to push this idea of woke being something. <laughs> Uh, instead of being what it is, which is the younger generations are much more sort of socially tolerant than older generations were, and that pretty much works in, in most societies, although there is a you know, critique of that by Schaefer in the Western European politics, there's a paper critiquing Norris and Hing Inglehart on that, but the, the data just can, kind of points in that direction. In the longer run, that probably suggests that we should expect a more tolerant politics to emerge, right? But, but clearly this is not what's happening in the short run. Um, which is why I suggest that in the end, if we could fix the economy and make people feel safer, then maybe our politics would be just less exasperated and less excitable, right? Um, which is, I guess, you know, what, where I would want it to go. But I'm not predicting that that's where it's going to get any anytime soon. I'll ask one more question yeah. um, from the Zoom audience. Uh, Tom is asking whether a PR system in... Um, in the US would lead to more egalitarian outcomes and um, a more democratic, uh, effective democratic government related to uh, yeah, yeah. this point earlier. That's a great question. I mean, it's a fantastic, you know, comparative po politics can factual, right? Um, there is strong, you know, observational evidence, as I guess what we call it these days. Uh, Ivis and the Soskis have, have produced a number of papers in the 2000s on this. Countries with PR have more inclusive and egalitarian economic institutions. That is a clear pattern that emerges. Because there are so few cases of countries with PR that don't have those institutions or vice versa, it is a very difficult argument to test. So, you know, this, is the, this would be a great laboratory. I mean, New Zealand did turn to PR. Uh, Italy went the other way. Um, Italy has, I think, become a bit more progressive since going for PR. Um, Italy has had rising inequality since going to for uh, a kind of pseudo first past the post uh, electoral system, which actually then got changed back to a form of PR. So, I mean, I, theoretically, I would say yes, it it would, because Leipard also made this argument years and years ago in his book Patterns of Democracy, and the reason would be that it should be harder in a PR system for a clique of very, very rich people to subvert the political system by buying votes in the way that the American elites very obviously do. But whether or not that would play it in the way we expect, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, would Trumpism have been able to take over the right of the American party system under a PR system? Or would Brexit have taken over the Conservative Party in, under a PR system? I'm guessing it probably wouldn't. So in a way, it does present a kind of barrier to, to um, yeah, to these kind of ex polar, very very polarized kinds of politics. All right, thank you very much, Jonathan, for a fascinating presentation, and thanks for the audience, also in uh, the audience here in Ancina Hall and on Zoom for attending our talk. Our next seminar is in in three weeks. Uh, we're going to have uh, Patrick Chamorel from the Stanford program in Washington, D.C., and he's going to talk about the French elections, so not unrelated to this topic, I would say. So thank you very much to all of you, and see you in three weeks. Thanks to you. Thanks.